Happy New Year to everybody. Here we are for another wonderful year of news about the plants of the world and the goings on at the New York Botanical Garden. Um, this is a series, as many of you know, that we've been doing for years. Um, when our scientists come back from remote places and fascinating places they've been, we ask them to come talk to us about what they've seen and what they've learned. And uh, so we want to we want to thank the Patrons Committee, the Garden Patrons Committee, and also the uh, Botanical Science Committee, uh, many of whom many of whose uh, members are here tonight, for getting us organized. Uh, tonight we're actually focusing on the the North American Plants Program of the Garden. Um, our particular concentration among North American plants is in the plants of the northeastern United States, and you'll be learning a lot about that along the way tonight. Um, this program to focus on North American plants was established in 2008 and uh, works to protect the plants of this part of the world through increased research, uh, science-based conservation, and uh, conservation efforts with uh, collegial organizations with which we uh, collaborate. Uh, this, is, this is only one of our, our major international programs. As many of you know, we are also working simultaneously, of course, in Southeast Asia, in many places in the tropical parts of Latin America, the Caribbean, uh, the eastern coastal forest of Brazil, and uh, the islands of the Pacific. So the New York Botanical Garden is really all over the world, but tonight we'll focus on the plants of, of our home continent. Um, we're going to, um, we're going to uh, hear from four scientists tonight uh, whose work in the field is very diverse, actually. You'll see that, it's, that we're touching many bases tonight. And you're going to learn about the discovery of a new biodiversity hotspot in the mid-Atlantic. And we're going to hear about research on the use of tropical plants for medicinal remedies by immigrant communities in New York City, and also the conservation of plants in the Hudson River estuary. So you see it's a very diverse set of uh, presentations. Um, they are very diverse, but I think they each illustrate how the garden scientists use their research to uh, protect the plants of the world, and especially those here in, in our backyard. Um, uh, I, we wanted you to know that uh, our moderator tonight is Brian Boom, Dr. Brian Boom, whom many of you have known over the years, um, most recently in his role as director of our um, uh, Caribbean research program, a very active program in Cuba that Brian established. Uh, Brian is now, he has a new position at the garden. He's called now Vice President for Conservation Strategy. And uh, this program has hardly been announced yet. You'll be seeing some announcements in your garden news and in your mail. He also continues his role as the Bassett McGuire Curator of Botany. So Brian's the moderator tonight. There's much, much interesting material for you here tonight. So uh, welcome, Brian Boom. Thank you very much, Gregory. Welcome, everybody. Um, in Gregory's introduction to the event tonight, he stated the scientists' goals of the garden very succinctly, protecting the plants of the world. At the end of the day, that's what it's really about. Tonight, you'll get a glimpse of how we go about doing that. Uh, the garden has more than 100 PhD level faculty, postdoctoral researchers, graduate students, and technical staff. All are working to fulfill the garden's scientific mission to explore, understand, and conserve Earth's vast biodiversity. As you know, tonight's presentation is focused on the North America program. It's here symbolized by this image of the largest uncut expanse of New York City woodland, uh, the woodland landscape in the garden's own Thane family forest, 50 acre native forest right in the Bronx. For nearly 125 years, garden scientists have studied and helped to protect the plants of North America from towering trees to microscopic algae, from the Bronx to Billings and beyond. As Gregory mentioned, the garden has an extensive range of research and conservation programs around the world. Um, in fact, the garden scientists currently are engaged in 250 international collaborations with 168 institutions in 49 countries. These collaborations are not, are not just with other botanists, but with professionals in other, uh, in other areas, such as ecologists, zoologists, geographers, geologists, anthropologists, physicians, educators, and policymakers, many, many kinds of people. Uh, and most of our lectures in these briefing series, if you've been to them before, are focused on projects that are conducted in far-flung parts of the world, uh, very exotic places. And I'll just mention two recent examples of expeditions to um, give you a taste of that. So this past November, Dr. Michael Balick was in Palau, where he's been working for several years on the integration of conventional health care treatments with traditional uses of plants 
and on the conservation of plant species of concern. One of his books on this topic is shown here, uh, published in 2012. In addition to field work, on this particular visit, he also organized the first symposium ever held on integrative medicine in the Micronesian region. It was a major event on the island with over 400 people in attendance. Another recent international example shown here is an expedition in Myanmar undertaken this past October by Drs. Douglas Daly and Kate Armstrong in partnership with scientists from the Wildlife Conservation Society, the local university, and the, uh, and the national uh, government forestry department in Myanmar. This was the first field trip for a project fun funded by the Helmsley Charitable Trust entitled Laying the Groundwork for Plant Conservation and Forest Resource Management in Myanmar. So why is this so important? It turns out that within tropical Asia, Myanmar has the smallest proportion of its flora documented. And thus it's greatly underrepresented in modern scientific studies. The country remains a botanical black hole on the map. And efforts to assess the botanical diversity of Myanmar are hampered by a severe lack both of human and institutional resources due to decades of neglect wrought by political upheaval. Myanmar has only has been closed off largely for the rest of the world for nearly 75 years, and only in the last year, with the, uh, the sanctions being lifted, has it begun to open up. Tonight, we turn to focus to the garden's research and conservation activities much closer to home. The origins of our current North American plant program, which Gregory mentioned began in 2008, can be traced all the way back to the beginning of the institution itself. In fact, the very first publication in the series, Memoirs of the New York Botanical Garden, Volume 1, published in 1900, was a 492-page book entitled The Catalog of the Floor of Montana and the Yellowstone National Park by Dr. Per Axel Rydberg, the first curator of the garden's herbarium. This was the garden's first book on plants of a park or any other protected area. Dr. Rydberg's expeditions in the summer of 1896 and 97 were extraordinarily productive. He collected over 1,800 plant specimens, representing about 800 species, of which 163 were new to science, incredible, such as the sedge, Carex pseudoscripoidea, the type specimen of which is shown here, which, is, which resides in the William Melinda Steer Herbarium at the garden. On the left is a page from Rydberg's field notebook, where this specimen is collection number 3412, collected on August 24, 1896, is listed. The original notebook is held in the garden's Lewester T. Mertz Library. As an example of how original botanical discoveries and descriptions are used in subsequent publications, here's a page from a volume one of Abrams and Illustrated Flora of the Pacific States, published in 1923, in which the Rydberg discovery mentioned was used as a basis for this species' illustration and description. You can appreciate that the botanical science, that botanical science has an important and enduring historical component. And so goes the scenario. Explanation, dis exploration, discovery, and description goes on, and our understanding as it does of the Earth's biodiversity increases and gets more refined and authoritative. Ever more, and thus ever more robust science-based conservation policies are, po are possible, and we're better able to protect the plants of the world. Hundreds of expeditions have followed throughout North America, and the results were published in hundreds of books and monographs and field guides. Shown here are some recent examples from the New York Botanical Garden Press, illustrating the geographic and, and thematic diversity of our science program. This year, for example, we'll be publishing at least four books on North American plants, A New Floor of Vermont, a book on the edible mushroom genus Agaricus in North America, a final volume of the acclaimed series on the floor of the Intermountain West, and this field guide right here on the lichens of northeastern North America, which arrived in my office last night, hot off the presses, literally, and available for sale back at the table during the reception. You should be the first one on your block to get one. And other publications are available, too. It's a very user-friendly book. So you can see the garden has um, an ambitious program on plants in North America. And tonight, we're going to have a snapshot of four of these. That, uh, the initiatives that have been selected to document the diversity of our activities, focusing on endangered species, invasive species, and species used medicinally. And next, we're going to hear from Dr. James Lendemer, who is a postdoctoral research associate in the Gardens Institute of Systematic Botany. 
He received his PhD from the City University of New York in his joint doctoral program with the Garden about three years ago, uh, as did I, but it was about 30 years ago. Yikes. Dr. Lindemer is a specialist in lichens, and he'll be talking to us about a newly discovered biodiversity hotspot in the mid-Atlantic region of the United States, based on his more than three years of research on the lichens in that coastal area. The, he will be followed by Dr. Rob Noxey, who is the Arthur J. Cronquist Curator of North American Botany in the Institute of Systematic Botany. He received his PhD from the University of Michigan and is a world expert on the sedges and other plants of the northeastern United States and adjacent Canada. His major project is to produce a detailed book on the identification of uh, and geographic distribution and habitats of the plants of this vast region, which will facilitate the protection of the northeastern U.S. plants. Now that's a very big topic. So tonight he'll focus on the species of one, most, one of the most critically imperiled groups of plants of the region, those of the intertidal zone. And finally, last but not least, we're going to shift gears uh, to the theme of medicinal plants and biocultural conservation, and we'll hear from Dr. Ina Vandenbroek, who's the Matthew Calberth Perry Assistant Curator of Economic Botany and Director of the Caribbean Program. Having received her PhD from Ghent University in Belgium, Dr. Vandenbroek is a specialist in plants that are used medicinally and in community health care systems. Tonight, she'll describe a project she is leading on the issue of medicinal plants by Latino and Caribbean communities in New York City. <clears throat> Thanks, Ken. So today I'm here to talk to you about the discovery of a biodiversity hotspot for lichens within a day's drive of New York City and the White House along the coast of North Carolina. So first off, what's a lichen? Lichens are fungi that have adopted a specialized lifestyle that involves the symbiosis with an alga for the purpose of, an, of obtaining nutrition. So if you look at a section of a thallus or the body of a lichen, which you can see on the right, the clear cells are the fungus and they're encapsulating the green cells, which are an alga. And if you look on the left, that's an example of a thallus or the body of a lichen, what you would see in the wild. Lichens are very diverse. There's more than 5,000 species that have been reported from North America, north of Mexico. Lichens are also incredibly important, and they're important in a lot of different ways. So let's just run through a few of them. The first one is lichens are important as ecosystem pioneers. They weather rocks, and they're important for the formation of soil upon which all plants subsequently grow. They're also very important in nutrient cycling, so nitrogen fixation and things like that. They're vital for maintaining climates in our forests. So they keep our forests from getting too hot, too cold, too dry, too wet. They keep everything just right. They're also used by many animals. Perhaps the best known example is caribou or reindeer, which subsist almost entirely upon lichens during the winter. So you can see the lichens are covering the ground in the Yukon here. Forgive me that I don't walk around taking pictures of caribou. They're also used by a tremendous diversity of small animals. So there's many insects and other groups of animals that rely upon lichens for critical parts of their life cycles. And perhaps most importantly, or most interestingly to me, lichens themselves function as microcosms. So within every single lichen, every single individual lichen that you see, there's a tiny universe comprised entirely of forms of life that occur nowhere else. And an example of that, are the little black dots that you see there, which are a species of fungus, Arthonia varians, that are only occurs within the fruiting bodies of a single species of crustose lichen, Lechonora rupicola. So lichens are very diverse, and they're also very important, but they're also very threatened. So what I see, and I suspect many of you see when you walk out your door in New York City, is the same thing that many people in the United States and across the world see, and that's forests like you see on the left. Forests that are degraded and largely devoid of lichens, like this mature forest from inner city Philadelphia. Compare that to a healthier, mature forest in the mountains of North Carolina. I think anyone here can tell, even without knowing much about lichens, that there's a significant difference in the amount of cover, let alone the diversity, just appreciating the colors, the sizes, the shapes. Imagine what those ecosystems that are lacking lichens, imagine how different those are from those that have them, given everything that I've said about their importance. 
So that's how I'd like to introduce to you the work that we've been doing in the Mid-Atlantic Coastal Plain. What is the Mid-Atlantic Coastal Plain? The Mid-Atlantic Coastal Plain comprises all of the low-lying ecosystems along the Atlantic coast between southern New Jersey and northern Florida. So within this area, we have a remarkable diversity of ecosystems. These range from coastal dunes like this one in Delaware, to coastal wetlands like this one on Assateague Island in Virginia, to maritime forests, which are a special type of coastal forest that occur in barrier islands like Assateague Island in, in Maryland and Virginia. There's a tremendous diversity of conifer swamps. This is an Atlantic white cedar swamp in Alligator River, North Carolina. There's also many hardwood swamps like this one in Pocosin Lakes in North Carolina. Probably noticing there's a lot of water. There's bottomland swamp forests that have palms in them like this one in North Carolina directly adjacent to majestic pine savannas, like this one also in North Carolina. There's even coastal barrier islands that are covered by palms and cacti, probably the last thing that you would expect growing along the Atlantic coast. And if that was not enough, oops, sorry. If that was not enough, there's even ecosystems that occur nowhere else on Earth, like Pocosins. These are a type of raised wetland that are restricted to a very small area of North Carolina. They occur nowhere else. So the Mid-Atlantic Coastal Plain is a tremendous national treasure. There are all of these ecosystems that occur here, and it shouldn't be surprising to learn that there are many forms of small and large plants and animals that occur here and nowhere else. Perhaps among the most iconic is this small plant, the Venus flytrap, or Dionia multiscapa. It occurs in a very small area of the Carolinas and nowhere else. That and in your grocery store, but it's not native to there. So the Mid-Atlantic Coastal Plain is a national treasure, but it's truly a beleaguered one. It has suffered significant impacts from human habitation for more than 400 years. So much so that only 12% of it remains in a natural state. The satellite image that you see here is characteristic of the entire region. You have large islands of natural habitat or intact natural habitat like the Great Dismal Swamp here in Virginia adjacent to the city of Norfolk and Hampton Roads, surrounded or effectively islands in amidst a sea of dense urbanization, suburbanization, agriculture, and industry. This area has been so heavily impacted that some ecosystems like the charismatic pine savannas that once characterized the entire southeastern United States have been almost completely destroyed. Lowland swamps fared better, presumably because they're wetter. They've only been reduced in extent by a half or a third in some cases, although in some cases even more. And so that's where we step in. Believe it or not, despite the fact that this is within a day's drive of major metropolitan areas of the East Coast, no one had ever looked at the lichens there and tried to figure out what was growing there. And so that's what we did. My colleagues and I from the New York Botanical Garden visited many sites and we inventoried every single species of lichen that we could find. That means we physically collected a specimen because you can't identify them with certainty in the field. You have to check everything in the lab. We brought them back to a field station to process our specimens and put preliminary identifications on them, like this one in the Virginia Institute of Marine Sciences in Virginia. Just to give you an idea of the scale of this work, all of those white paper packets on that table represent one person's work for one day in the field. Multiply that over the amount of time that I'll talk about shortly. At the end of every trip and at the end of the study, we bring everything back to the William and Linda Steer Herbarium at the New York Botanical Garden. We study our specimens, we compare them to all of the other specimens that are already at the New York Botanical Garden and form part of the largest lichen collection in the Western Hemisphere. And we synthesize all of this inf information to really tell us what we can know about the lichens of the region and how they should be conserved. So just to give you an idea of the total area and total amount of what we did, we spent more than 18 weeks in the field that's more than 1,200 person hours. And we visited more than 300 sites. So if you look at this map, all of the red dots are sites that we visited and we've processed all of the data for. The yellow dots, which are far fewer in number, thankfully, are the sites that we visited and we haven't processed the specimens or the data for yet. So those are specimens that are sitting on the floor of my office back in the New York Botanical Garden. 
So from those more than 300 sites, we've collected more than 14,000 voucher specimens. That means more than 14,000 individual lichens that traveled from their homes in the forests of the southeastern United States to relocate to New York City, much more desirable real estate. Those more than 14,000 vouchers yielded more than 700 species. But what does that mean, really? Well, we've learned a lot. We've been able to identify the ranges of endemic species, so species that occur nowhere else. Here are two examples from the reindeer lichens, Cladonia atlantica and Cladonia subtenuous, both of whose core ranges are within the mid-Atlantic coastal plain. So within Delmarva, southern New Jersey, and also in um, Long Island. We've also been able to assess the northern distributional limits of many tropical and tr subtropical species. So that's tremendously important from the standpoint of climate change. So here are three maps of three different species, and you can see that the northernmost dot is the northernmost known population. It lies within the mid-Atlantic coastal plain, and we found it as part of this study. 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, we can go back and we can look at the distributions of those species and we can see how they've changed over time, potentially as a result of climate change. Now, from my standpoint, what I think one of the most interesting and most important aspects of this work has been, and especially in, form, in terms of informing conservation, is really the fact that we've been able to evaluate the distribution patterns of actual diversity. So, what we found is that the highest concentration of species diversity and genus level diversity, so the highest concentration of species and genera in the entire region is within a very small region of coastal North Carolina. And that is, if I can get this pointer to work, I guess not, uh, that is the Albemarle Pamlico Peninsula. It's a relatively small area but it has the largest contiguous natural areas left in the entire mid-Atlantic coastal plain. So it's here on the left. You can see that there's a lot of green there, which is not what you see everywhere else in satellite images of the mid-Atlantic. Now, it might look pretty uniform to you, it's all green, but in fact, it's very diverse. So here's a map of, on the right of all of the different forest types in Alligator River National Wildlife Refuge, which is one of the large management units in this area. Every one of those colors represents a different forest type. And within each different forest type, you can get a completely different suite of lichens. We found more than 400 species, so that's more than half of the species known from the entire mid-Atlantic. Some of them, like Phaeographis auricula, occur nowhere else. Others, like Stictodiana, mostly occur nowhere else. Why is this area important? It's important because this is the only place that you can go in the entire mid-Atlantic and you can see the forests and you can see the lichens like they would have been 400 years ago prior to the extensive impacts that we've had in the region. So this is a national treasure, but it's a highly imperiled one. So the, the influences and the impacts that have happened everywhere else in this region are also playing out here. We have massive agricultural projects like the one on the left and right next to the National Wildlife Refuge of Pocosin Lakes. So you can see the road divides a large agricultural project and a natural habitat. We have lots of catastrophic events now, like on the right, which was a massive wildfire that burned more than six square miles of the Great Dismal Swamp. We have islands of natural habitat, but islands only exist so long if they're burned down. In this region, the major threat, however, is actually from sea level rise. All of the most diverse sites that we visited lie within 1.5 meters of sea level. That is well within the most conservative estimates of what will be inundated by 2100, something that I could potentially see in my lifetime. Now, you don't have to wait to 2100 to experience this. What you can go there and see is healthy swamp forests like you're seeing on the right in Alligator River, turning into dead and dying forest as a result of sea level rise and saltwater intrusion. So as I said, lichens are threatened, and the fact that they're threatened everywhere that they occur makes these special areas where diversity persists even more precious and more important. Now we know from the wealth of data that's available in the Linda and William Steer Herbarium at the Botanical Garden that what we are seeing happen is species are disappearing and have disappeared in the eastern United States and throughout the world. And that's a huge problem. 
So what are we doing about that? Well, in this specific region and everywhere else that we're working, we're, we're taking a lot of different sort of approaches to conservation. The first is scientific description. We found dozens and dozens of species new to science, many of which occur nowhere else. Rather than giving you Latin names for the 12 species that I've put up here, I think you should all look at them and hopefully appreciate the diversity of colors, shapes, and forms. To me, that's more important to appreciate than the scientific classification of them, which is more technical and can come later. Secondly, we've done a lot of scientific outreach. So that means peer-reviewed publications to raise awareness of biodiversity in this region and the threats to biodiversity in this region. And of course, a huge component of this is outreach and training. So we work with amateurs, members of the public, professionals, everyone we can talk to, we will tell them about lichens and why they're important and why they should be protected. So there's all of these species that occur nowhere else and many of which are critically imperiled. As part of this work, we're moving forward with formally petitioning them for endangered species status with the Fish and Wildlife Service in the United States, and also moving forward internationally with IUCN red listing. And finally, what I think is among the most important things that we're doing is we're actually working on the ground with land managers, Nature Conservancy, Fish and Wildlife Service, Forest Service, all of these different agencies and organizations to develop management strategies on the ground that actually could potentially conserve lichens in the places where they occur, like in the Albemarle Pamlico hotspot. And so with that, I'd like to acknowledge everyone who supported us. So the National Science Foundation, I'd like to acknowledge a uh, board member and science committee chairman, George Milne and his wife, Carol. And I'd also like to thank the many colleagues and collaborators that we worked with, ranging from the National Park Service to the Nature Conservancy and members of the general public, all of whom are strongly committed to conserving native species and protecting America's natural heritage for future generations. So thank you very much, and I'd like to introduce Robert Noxie next. James, thank you very much. That was certainly an inspiring presentation. And at this point, I'm very excited to share with you my work in conservation of the plants of the Northeast. And what I must do first is introduce my bigger project in which conservation fits. And that project is the preparation of a new manual of plants of the Northeast. This is for spontaneous plants, those that grow without cultivation in the area. In other words, they grow wild. And what this does is it builds on the long-term legacy of the New York Botanical Garden, started by our founding director, Nathaniel Lord Britton. Indeed, he published the first manual in 1901, and the copy that's still in print at this point was authored by Henry Gleason and Arthur Conquest published by the New York Botanical Garden Press in 1991. Now, what the new manual will do is provide crucial information, and I provide just a sampling of that kind of information here. First of all, we will have up-to-date names and classifications. This is so important because of the last two decades of advances in plant science brought to us most especially by DNA-based studies of molecular systematics. Another thing that we're providing, my collaborators and I are producing new tools for enabling accurate identifications. Let's be sure we know what species we're talking about. Also, we're making it very clear about the status, the native versus non-native status for every species, including those non-natives that are invasives. Again, so important because of the rapid increase in invasives during the last two decades. And then another highlight new with this version of the manual is the conservation status of every species is being briefly reviewed in this work. So what about the audience? This book, the one that exists and all those before it, and I have every reason to believe the new manual, will have a huge impact. That's because this is an indispensable reference. The only one that brings together the kind of information I just reviewed as, as well as much, much more. So who uses the manual? Really everyone who wants to know about the spontaneous plants of the Northeast. Most especially conservationists, land managers, and field botanists. What about the area covered? When we say the Northeast, we mean the Northeast in a grand way. 
You can see the area of coverage is huge. Indeed, it's 29% of the area of the contiguous 48 states. Not only is it large, but it's biodiverse. So within this area, we have approximately 5,300 species and 200 families. And this represents fully one quarter of all of the species of higher plants in North America and 65% of the families. Of those species, approximately 100 are restricted to this area or endemic, the term that James introduced to us. And then we also find not only are these species restricted or endemic, but also certain ecoregions. Of the 19 ecoregions that are found in this area, seven of them are found nowhere else. Okay, as a conservationist, the group of plants within the manual that interests me the most are the natives. And I do have to say, the news is alarming. This is a summary of some recent studies that point to declines in our native flora. Now, one thing I want you to mention, besides the rate of decline, is the areas that have been studied. They range from a park to a county. In fact, we have two counties. The point I'm making is that all of these studies that have been done to date are very site-specific. They're limited by geography. And I contend what we really need now is a study that is habitat-specific. And for that reason, about three and a half years ago, I initiated this project about which I'll speak for most of the rest of my presentation now. And that is the conservation assessment of intertidal plants of the Hudson River. Well, the first question is, what are intertidal plants? And fortunately, this view of a bay just north of Saugerties shows us this phenomenon quite well. This is the extreme low tide mark, and up here is the usual high tide mark. In between, we have all of this habitat that's exposed twice daily and is inhabited usually by a diversity of plants. These are the inter tidal or between the tides, the intertidal plants. Let's orient ourselves to the Hudson River estuary. The estuary is that portion of the Hudson River that is tidally influenced. And the most remarkable fact about it is its great length. It's 153 miles long and ranges from Battery Park at the very southern tip of Manhattan all the way up to just north of Albany to the city of Troy, where in fact the federal dam stops the tidal influence. This is the second longest estuary in the Northeast. The only other one that's longer is the Chesapeake Bay, and that's not really a fair comparison because most of the Chesapeake Bay is indeed embayed. The Hudson is not embayed. So in terms of a river estuary, it is the longest in the Northeast. And then the last point I want to make is that the tidal amplitude is actually quite modest. The usual tidal range is only three to four feet. Why study intertidal plants? First and foremost, we study them because they provide essential ecosystem services. First off, these plants provide food and shelter for wildlife, a great variety of birds, mammals, fish, etc. Next, they stabilize shorelines. And then the final point I want to make is that they mitigate the destructive effects of storm surges. And what I'm showing you here is a botanist's eye view from within a tidal marsh, and this one's quite typical, near Ossining. And you can see that many of the plants tower over this botanist. And the point I'm making is that when these plants are intact in these habitats, when the ha the habitats are healthy. Even late in the season, like I show here, where many of the plants have said nest but are still standing, these plants provide a buffer. And we found that there's one thing that showed this clearly, and that is Superstorm Sandy. Sandy, as we know, ravaged many coastal communities. It also happened on the shores of the Hudson but those communities that had, like Piermont, for example, just south of the Tappan Zee Bridge on the west side of the Hudson, Piermont fared well in comparison to surrounding communities because of its buffering tidal marsh. 
Another reason for studying intertidal plants is that many of them are restricted to this habitat, so they're ecologically restricted, but also geographically. So what I've done here is mapped the total global distribution of this one species of intertidal plant in the sunflower family, the estuary bidens. And you can see that the total range of this plant is from southern New York to northeastern Maryland, and that's it. In fact, when we look at the rivers, we see that this plant is confined to only seven rivers in the entire world. And this is a fairly typical situation for these intertidal plants. Another reason for studying intertidal plants is these plants are in trouble. They are threatened. They're imperiled. Why is that? They face many threats, and I'll just run through a few of the most important ones. First of all, saltwater intrusion as a consequence of climatic warming as sea levels rise. These plants have certain tolerances for salinity levels. So when we increase the sal salinity, that wreaks havocs, havoc for the health of, these, of many of these species. Another problem is pollution, of course. Another one is competition from invasive species. And I show here one of them that has become quite familiar to many of us, the Eurasian reed or Phragmites. It's now ubiquitous throughout the estuary. Sedimentation, and finally development as the major threats against these plants. Well, given the threats that these plants face and their environmental restrictiveness, they are sensitive indicators for envir of environmental health. And I contend that intertidal plants should be conservation priorities, but unfortunately they have not received the attention they deserve. So my objective through this study, along with my field assistants, is to conduct conservation assessments of the species that are restricted or nearly restricted to the intertidal habitats of the Hudson estuary. How did we do this work? Well, first, we had to come up with a list. To show you how poorly known these species are, this is just one example. There is no published list of, of intertidal species. So through our direct field work, as well as review of the literature, we found that there are 32 species of plants that inhabit the intertidal zone and are restricted or nearly restricted to that habitat. Next, what we did was we assembled a historic baseline of the occurrences. We learned where these plants used to live by reviewing the herbarium record. So what I'd like to do is show you an example of a specimen. This is the river quillwort. Isoetes riparia. It's a specimen that is found in the William and Linda Steer Herbarium of the New York Botanical Garden. And let's take a close look at its collection label. And what we see here is the scientific name of the river quillwort, followed by its author, Engelmann, habitat, high water line, and then the locality, mouth of creek just above Peekskill, the collection date, August 1869, William Leggett is the collector, followed by the Latin abbreviation for collector. Mouth of Creek, just above Peekskill. Here we are with an aerial view. There's Peekskill. There is Annsville Creek. And here's the mouth. These herbarium specimens are that good. This is the physical proof that that species inhabited that area at that time. So I went back there, I found the habitat, there's plenty of it there, but unfortunately I did not find the species. Okay, the next thing we did, as I've already hinted, is conduct field work. And I say we because I benefited from the assistance of many volunteers and one dedicated part-time field assistant. The way we did this was we capitalized on the daily narrow window of opportunity about two and a half hours before all the way up through extreme low tide to two and a half hours after. The rest of the time we used for scouting access points and reviewing data. We accessed our sites primarily by kayak, as you can see here, and we walked thoroughly through the habitat to make sure we left no plants unturned. Next, we are analyzing the data, and I use the present tense because this is the portion of the project in which I'm currently engaged. Well, let's look at the results. And what I did for the conservation assessments is categorize the species, and my first category is secure. 
And the water hemp is one example of the secure species. And my key here is that I show the historic localities based on the specimens in gray squares, and then I use the uh, red circles for current occurrences that we documented through our field work. And you can see this species is known from throughout the estuary. We know it from many populations. We call it secure because we have every confidence that this species will be with us well into the future. In contrast, we have the example of the river quillwort, which I've already mentioned. We were able to document only three populations versus the many that were known in the past. Clearly, this is a species that has declined. Worse still are the extirpated species, exemplified by Parker's pipework. These are the species that have disappeared. Yes, they've declined, but it's to the point that they're locally extinct, gone from the Hudson. We covered over 118 different sites very thoroughly, including all of the historic sites for this species. We can be as confident as anyone can that this species is gone now. It was last seen on the Hudson in 1944. So this is the summary of the conservation status of the 32 species in our target group of intertidal plants. And unfortunately, the results are grim. Fully 81% of the species have declined or disappeared. Only 19% of them, only six species, are actually doing well. We can consider them secure. Well, as I admitted, the news is grim. But the last thing I want to do is leave you feeling depressed. Let's have some hope. And really, there are reasons for hope. And I'd like to review those briefly now. First of all, as shown here, we recently have published the Hudson River Estuary Habitat Restoration Plan by the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. We participated in the drafting and writing of this document. We're pleased that we were involved and that New York State DEC took us in our work very seriously. They're very interested. In fact, as I'll mention now, we continue to work with the DEC. So the DEC is now hosting, in fact, just last week was the third of four planned meetings, it's hosting public meetings about intertidal systems focused on Piermont Marsh as part of the Tappan Zee Bridge mitigation. So I was invited to appear and present in the very first scientific meeting, which I did in September. And then another example of why we can be hopeful is that I am assisting the DEC and its staff, many staff, with developing restoration plans. And we're now to the point where we're exploring how to propagate these plants. These species are so poorly known, nothing is known about that. We're starting from the very beginning, and we're working with the Greenbelt Native Plant Center of New York City Parks Department. At this point, I want to wrap up by briefly summarizing why this work is so vitally important. And the first thing is, this is the first comprehensive study of the Hudson River's intertidal plants. Also, consider the fact that though we know little about them, these plants are unique parts of our shared natural heritage. They're worth conserving for that reason alone. But they also provide essential ecosystem services. So from a selfish standpoint, that makes them all the more valuable to us. They're also sensitive indicators of environmental change, as if we need another sign of bad news. But we have it here. But we can move forward. The good news is we still have most of the species with us. Some are barely hanging on, but at least there's with us. they are with us, and now is a critical point in history to make a difference. And we are making a difference. We're working with DEC to plan for the restoration of these communities, and also bringing it back to my larger work, the work I'm doing in the Hudson is helping inform the manual for a set of species that are otherwise very, very poorly known. I would like to acknowledge many individuals, but most especially, Mr. and Mrs. Thomas Hubbard and the Harriet Ford Dickinson Foundation, as well as an anonymous private trust and the Hudson River Foundation, all for generously funding this work. I also thank my field team, Charlie Zimmerman, Jenna Dory, Suniti Jag, Eric Kiviat, Nava Tabak, 
Sarah Walker and David Warrior for spending countless hours out there in the mud with me. And then I also thank Becky Hurdy and Michelle Nazi, my daughter, for assistance with maps. And my major collaborators, the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, as I mentioned, as well as Hudsonia and Scenic Hudson. And at this point, I am very pleased to invite Dr. Ina Vonderbrook. Thank you, Rob. And uh, so far, we've heard some very interesting presentations about algae, lichens, and intertidal plants in the Northeast. And it is my pleasure, as the last speaker of this evening, to bring you even closer to home, back to the heart of New York City, where Latino and Caribbean immigrants use medicinal plants for healthcare. Now, the scientific disciplines that study um, the use, the relationships between people, plants, culture, and healthcare are ethnobotany and ethnomedicine. And ethnobotany identifies the botanical names, the scientific names of the plants that are known by local communities by their common names. As you can see here, in this species called red hen in Jamaica. Ethnomedicine as a part of medical anthropology, also looks into cultural expressions about disease. What do local people mean when they talk about fog in the eyes? To what kind of biomedical disease does this relate? So it's, you might think that uh, people's use of herbal remedies for healthcare is something that is restricted to remote tropical areas but it's also very much a part of daily life in urban areas in the United States. As you can see here in an article that was published by the New York Times in 2008, and the picture shows a Mexican healer in her living room treating patients with plants. The picture here below is one that I took in a shop in New York City where Latino and Caribbean immigrants sell herbal remedies. And there are different reasons why immigrant communities, when they come to the US, might prefer to continue using their herbal remedies. It may be because of their undocumented status, their lack of access to biomedical healthcare, but also very much because it's part of their cultural traditions. And people have a lot of faith in their herbal remedies. Very importantly, they very often do not want to disclose to their healthcare providers, if they even go and see one, that they're using herbal remedies. So you might think now, why is it so important that we identify the botanical names, the scientific names of these herbal remedies? And this plant that you can see here, uh, I uh, collected the roots in New York City in a herbal shop. And uh, this is a botanical collection that I made back in the Dominican Republic. Well, this plant species is uh, native to the Caribbean. And if you go to different countries, it has different local or common names. Yet it refers to one and the same species, Ruelia tuberosa. Now, if we want to know anything about the conservation status of this plant, then we need to know the botanical name. Likewise, if we need some information about the biological activity of this plant remedy, to know if it has been studied before in the laboratory, then we also need to know the botanical name. Imagine there is this plant in the Dominican Republic that's called tuna. If you go to the um, natural li National uh, Library of Medicine and you uh, put uh, tuna in the search engine, you get information on heavy metal accumulation in tuna fish nothing about this herbal remedy. So that shows why it's so important to uh, identify the botanical names. So in 2005, we started our work with the Dominican community in New York City. So we interviewed 175 people from the Dominican Republic who were born there, but who are now living in New York City. And uh, on this map, you can see areas where uh, many Dominicans live, so certainly in the Bronx and in upper Manhattan or Washington Heights. So from these interviews, we got a long list of more than 250 common names. So what's the next step to go plant hunting in the urban environment in New York City? And what you can see here is a botanica shop. These are 
uh, shops operated by Latino and Caribbean immigrants that sell herbal remedies for physical health, but also plants and other products for spiritual health. And they operate as invisible healthcare systems that run parallel to biomedical healthcare. And there are literally hundreds of them, and they have been very poorly studied. We did uh, research in the Bronx together with a student from Columbia University, and we found 68 botanicas in the Bronx only. So this is inside the botanica, and it shows us that we don't always have to go to the tropics. Sometimes the tropics just comes to us, and all we need is a metro card. So these are boxes and boxes full of dried herbal, herbal remedies that we identified. And for, from these results, uh, we identified 219 botanical species. So a question that you can ask is, what are the health conditions that Dominican immigrants commonly use medicinal plants for in New York City? And they are not only using them to treat the common cold, the flu, or an upset stomach. It also, and I've highlighted um, the, these conditions, they're, these are chronic and modern lifestyle il illnesses. So we're often talking about traditional medicine, but traditional medicine is also very modern and dynamic. I do not have the time to talk to you about uh, 219 species that we identified, but I'm showing you these ones that are uh, the top three, the most commonly uh, mentioned, uh, because also many of you will know them. It's uh, aloe vera, um, lime and lemon, and bitter orange. And if you look at the column with medicinal uses, you see again uh, diabetes, arthritis, hypertension, and sinusitis popping up, the chronic and modern lifestyle illnesses. It's also very important, our research shows, that we do not lump Latinos and Caribbeans together as one homogenous group. There are cultural differences in their use of herbal remedies. In a survey uh, among 20 Dominicans, 20 Puerto Ricans, and 20 Mexicans, we found that Dominicans uh, prefer preferentially use uh, aloe vera or sabila to treat the flu, um, Puerto Ricans to treat asthma and chest congestion, and Mexicans to treat the common, uh, to treat, sorry, burns. So what are the implications of our research for conservation? This is a plant species called Canelilia that is commonly available in New York City botanicas. Any botanica that we entered in the Bronx had the species available. It's endemic to Hispaniola, the island that shares two uh, sovereign nations, Dominican Republic and Haiti, and its conservation status is vulnerable. Yet, it's very commonly available in the international trade and it's sold and used in New York City for uh, conditions as the common cold, flu, fever, headache, and menstrual pain. So these species that we identified are available online for viewing in this CV Star vir virtual herbarium from, from the New York Botanical Garden and they're accessible by anyone with an internet connection. Another implication of our research is for education of healthcare providers. And we asked our interviewees, our Dominican interviewees, do you believe there exist health conditions that a medical doctor does not understand or cannot cure? Almost 80% of the 175 people we interviewed said sure. And they gave us a list of more than 20 different conditions. I've highlighted the top 10 on the right, and the ones that I italicized are the ones that have a strong cultural component, meaning that the, these communities have their own cultural explanations about what the symptoms are and how they should be treated and what the causes of these conditions are. And very importantly, they do not talk to their healthcare providers about this. Instead, they use their herbal remedies and their traditional medicine. So, as from 2008, um, we started a cultural competency training program for healthcare providers at the New York Botanical Garden based on these results with the goal to um, 
promote a better dialogue between healthcare providers and their Latino and Caribbean patients. So there is increased, improved disclosure by patients about their use of herbal remedies. And there is more trust and awareness and communication between both. So we developed a number of training exercises. Since 2008, we trained more than 740 medical students and healthcare providers in more than 45 different exercises. Um, I give lectures. We also uh, do interview exercises, so we teach them how to ask culturally sensitive questions about their patients' use of herbal remedies. We do role play exercises in which we present case scenarios. And um, I also take them on tours, guided tours of those botanica shops, those invisible healthcare system in New York City, where they can interact directly with a plant specialist on the premises. And this picture that you see here is a half day of training of a metropolitan hospital center staff from the emergency room department. So we had lectures, and then at the end of the training, I took them on a tour of the Enid A. Haupt Conservatory to show them the living Caribbean plant collection, to talk to them about cultural uses, potential herb drug interactions, and potential toxicity issues associated with these plants. After that training exercise, I asked them to fill in a questionnaire and to self-assess their cultural knowledge, their attitudes toward the, 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 their Latino and Caribbean patients' use of herbal remedies, and their skills in initiated, initiating a dialogue with their patients. And what you can see from this graph, and it's very positive and hopeful, is that there is a significant increase in cultural knowledge and in cultural attitudes towards their patients' use of her herbal remedies after the training. And um, with that, I would like to thank all the community members that we've interviewed for generously sharing their knowledge, the healthcare providers that we've worked with, the uh, medical schools, um, and uh, family health centers as well, the people who are funding our research and the institutions, and last but not least, all the students I've worked with because they represent the next generation. I thank you for your attention. Okay, great. Thank you so much um, to our speakers. I'd like to ask them to assemble here at the table for a very brief uh, question and answer period. And you also have the opportunity, while they're getting in position to, let, let me tell you, for interacting with them one-on-one -on -one, uh, during the reception. Uh, in the back of the room, you'll find, in addition to the books we have for sale, uh, a new newsletter available free of charge right over here on that side of the back. So some of the uh, information we heard about tonight is explained more in detail there. So uh, guys, have a seat. So questions from the audience. I have one, if no one else does, to get started. I don't want to take advantage of my opportunity here. Todd Forrest has a question, please. Um, hi. Uh, thank uh, thank you to all the speakers. Those were all <laughs> fascinating presentations. Um, I had a specific question for James about lichens as indicators of air quality. It's my understanding that lichens are highly sensitive to ozone and sulfur dioxide pollution, and thus, as you saw in uh, Pennsylvania, um, more or less have been absent from urban ecosystems. Um, it's been my observation over 16 years at the garden uh, that lichen abundance, if not diversity, seems to have increased. <coughs> of course, that's just from the back of my golf cart as I'm speeding around, so there's no science behind that. Um, uh, uh, have you seen that in your studies uh, around the Northeast? Yeah, so that's actually something that certainly is true. Um, you know, I run in Central Park every day, and I know that 20 years ago there were not lichens in Central Park for the most part and now there is perfectly large, healthy individuals growing on rocks and trees in places. Uh, my graduate student, Jessica Allen, actually participated in the BioBlitz that they had there last year, and we found 20-some species, including one that we totally didn't expect to find there, something that's actually relatively rare. Um, but that's a success story that's pretty limited because we have a lower diversity than what you would naturally see in intact forests and intact ecosystems, certainly. 
far fewer species and far lower abundance. Most of what we see are species that would occur on the edges of forests uh, and in disturbed areas for the most part. But yes, that's certainly progress compared to what was there 20 years ago. Yes. Another question here on this side. <clears throat> for wonderful presentations. They were absolutely so engaging. <clears throat> My question is to Dr. Robert Noxey. Um, have you thought, and I know a lot of your work seems to be dependent upon volunteers as well as staff, um, have you thought about engaging high school students in terms <clears throat> of helping to manage uh, the, uh, the shorelines and the, the uh, intercoastal areas? Because uh, that would be such a fabulous thing for high school students in the tri-state area to engage in. Thank you very much for that suggestion, which I think is wonderful. To answer your question, no, I hadn't thought of that yet. <laughs> so I'm so glad that you suggested it. Coming close to it, I was recently invited by um, some folks that attended a presentation I gave to the Hudson River Foundation to give some guided walks of intertidal areas and he essentially promised that there would be young people at those walks. And I'm interested in showing anybody and everybody, including young people. So thank you for your, your suggestion. I think that's a great one. Yes, sir. Question for Dr. Carroll. Uh, uh, question for Dr. Carroll. Uh, when you compare the water quality indicators from what you see here with what you see in the areas uh, where the um, alga is going extinct. What are the differences? I think that the, um, <clears throat> thank you for the question, excuse me. I think one of the big problems where involved with the native habitat where it's going extinct is pollution. Um, I think there's a lot of agricultural runoff and what happens is the pollution itself doesn't directly kill the alga, but what it does is it allows more aggressive algae to outgrow it. So there's that problem. We do have <clears throat> the question of why is it doing so well here um, as well uh, compared to its native habitat. And I think that's um, a direct result of the herbivores that will eat this species quite readily in the in Eurasia, and they aren't found here. Or in the areas that those herbivores are found, you won't find the starry stonewort in the specific lakes where they're found. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, or, yeah. Is the uh, FDA or any authorities harassing the herb stores in the Kurunjaro sphere in New York? Yeah, that's a good question. I get um, sometimes emails from the agricultural inspection at the airports. They uh, confiscate <coughs> plants from people's luggage and then ask me to identify those species. So definitely there is some concern about um, vulnerable, threatened plants that, that come to these botanicas. But, um, People are also very creative in getting them there. Um, one um, <laughs> one uh, winter, I found some boxes of fresh Melocactus lameri, which is an endemic plant of the Dominican Republic, um, sold in botanica shops, fresh, uh, at $60 a piece, so not even very cheap. Um, you know, and this plant is, is uh, vulnerable. It's threatened with extinction, so, but somehow these plants still arrive in New York City sometimes. We'll have just Again, two, more, two more questions, one in the back and then one up here. For Dr. Vandenbroek, um, do you work at all on um, judging the effectiveness of any of these um, herbal remedies? Yes, so um, we at the New York Botanical Garden are not engaged directly in laboratory studies, but we do have collaborations. During our NIH grants, uh, we collaborated with the University of Mississippi, the National Center for Natural Products Research, 
and we submitted um, the 75 most commonly reported plant species for testing in the laboratory for their anti-inflammatory mm -hmm. activity. And um, of these 75 species, 40% showed biological activity in in vitro models. Mm -hmm. It's not, not mm -hmm. clinical studies, but in vitro models uh, for anti-inflammatory activity. So that's uh, a, a much larger hit rate than when you do random plant sampling and then you submit them to laboratory testing. Was there one more in the front or not? This is for Dr. Lendemeyer, right? Um, mm -hmm. Can you explain how you define native and non-native? Because there's always this ongoing uh, discussion or issue about is there really a native plant? Well, that's a great question, and thankfully it's one that I don't really have to answer because all lichens are native. But you may have intended that question for Dr. Noxie. <laughs> but we don't have the problem I of did, invasive species that the vascular plants are. Rob, you want to take a shot at it? Sure. I, I, this is a very timely question. It's an excellent one, and you are so right to ask it. But I want to try to keep my answer to just a couple of minutes. That's the challenge here. <laughs> I will say this, that I'm engaged with several other botanists here in New York State in actually defining native. And that sounds trivial, but it matters because laws are being enacted as we speak that require, for example, planting of natives. So what I can say, this is still in draft form on our committee, and I don't want to reveal too much, but any uh, definition of native really should reflect a sense of place and a sense of time. So in other words, we need to talk about, we need to have a starting point. And some people say, oh, it's since the arrival of Europeans. If everyone to, agrees on that, that can work, for example. But we also need to have the geographic scope. So we can talk about native to New York City, native to southern New York, native to New York State, native to North America. So again, it matters. So those are the two main requirements of any definition of native. So how would I define it? Should I really stick my neck out? Okay, well, the way I was using it was uh, in, in my talk on in intertidal species, and I mentioned invasives, for example, is I was referring to the entire Gleason and Cronquist region, in other words, the amplified, augmented northeast, as we call it. And anything that we have evidence was present here before the arrival of Europeans, we would call that native. There are very few species that are in the gray area but that does settle the question for almost anything. I know some of my colleagues would disagree with that, but that's how I'm defining it for the use of the manual. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. I'd like to thank you all for coming. I hope to see you in the Bronx at the Botanical Garden soon. I'd like to thank our speakers tonight. Thank you. Thank you.